morning. Hope you're having a great week. Uh, hopefully you get a reprieve from finals any minute now <laughs> after I send this to you. So what I'm gonna do is start with piano first and then go into voice so it'll just all be in one spot for you. The next time I actually see you will be January. I think I mentioned that on the phone yesterday. So it'll be a few weeks. Um, feel free to absolutely take a little bit of a break from normal practice and kind of whatever that routine normally looks like. Enjoy your time off from school. Enjoy your time over the holidays and with your family. Um, just make sure that before you come back in January, we've kind of started to build our way back into that, that practice routine again. So just make sure you don't do absolutely nothing over the whole um, three weeks between now and when I see you next. So I guess it's two weeks off. Yeah, that would actually be three weeks. Okay, yeah, sounds like such a long time. Uh, okay, so for piano theory, we'll go over that first here. Pull up what you sent me. Oh, and I've been forgetting to mention this. I'm trying to be better about it, but it would probably be helpful too when you watch this the first time to just grab a pencil and, and jot some notes down for yourself so that that way, if you're forgetting what to do or if you wanna kind of refer back where you would normally look at the practice notes that I write for you during a lesson, you can actually see some notes, right? Rather than having to go back and, and rewatch the whole video or kind of try and parse your way through it to look for specific things. Um, so might be a good idea if you and don't end up using it, that's fine. But just so that you have that, if you would like to refer back to it when you're working on stuff in the future, that way you don't have to refer back to the video every single time. Um, there'll be some stuff, especially for piano that I'm gonna demo for you that might be helpful to refer back to over the break. But other than that, it's kind of nice to just have something written to have as an option. Okay, so we have page 16 for the theory. Overall, we did a great job. There's a couple places where we maybe got a little bit mixed up on either notes or intervals. So I just wanna touch base on those real quick, make sure it all makes sense. So the first section is number 17. Okay, so I am looking at the second column of exercises on number 17. So let's see, I know it's reflecting really bad, but if this is the first column, this is the second column. So these three are the ones I wanna look at first. Um, so let's see, I wrote them down. I can't read my handwriting. Okay, so the first one on, oh, and then I closed out of it, nice. The first one on the second column at the top there, we have D to A to G, which is correct for your note names. But for the intervals, D going up to A is a fifth, but A coming down to G would just be a second, not a third. If you notice that's stepping from a line to a space. So easy fix there, um, but that would be a second, not a third. And then the one right underneath that, the D, F, D is perfect. And right underneath that, um, we have the intervals perfect. We are going down a fifth and then going up a sec uh, seventh, excuse me. But we got a little mixed up on the note names it looks like. So you have all space notes here on this one. Your first note on the third space of bass clef, that would be an E, not a D. And then your next note would be an A, not a G. Because if you want to use a mnemonic, we could use all cows eat grass for that. Um, and then the very last note there in the space, that would actually be the G, right? So um, just be careful there. It looks like we maybe were using the line notes for bass clef or just got a little bit mixed up there. So again, as long as that makes sense, we're good to go. And then number 18 is the next section on the bottom of the page. And this one was perfect except for on the first column this time. So on the column on the left, the middle exercise, so the one that's in bass clef, um, we got a little mixed up on the directions and I wasn't totally sure about your notes here. Okay, so we wanted to go a third down from B. It looks like we went a third up. So if you were going a third up, yes, a third up would be D. Um, but then they asked us to go a sixth up and it looks like you went a sixth down. 
six, but that wouldn't be a G. So I wasn't sure exactly where where that was going. Again, you might have been thinking lines instead of, of spaces there. Um, so the biggest thing was just that, again, if, if we were kind of following the reverse instructions, your notes are good there, but we missed the, the third note name and then we actually wanted to reverse them, go a third down and a sixth up. Again, it's all that little annoying theory notation rule stuff, right? <laughs> the stuff that's super easy to miss as long as it makes sense then we are good to go there. So over the break, we're gonna do a little bit more. I'm actually gonna have you work on two pages. So the first one will be page 17, just right after what we did. And here we're just, again, reviewing intervals, but using a slightly different approach for how we identify the patterns. So you're just going to be filling in the actual letter names of the musical alphabet based on following a pattern of the same recurring interval. So for example, on number 19, they're writing letter names to form thirds going up. So they start you on A, a third up from A would be C, a third up from C would be E. You'll continue that pattern and then you just wanna double check at the end, they give you the last letter in the sequence. You wanna make sure that it all fits. If it is a different interval than what it should be, it means somewhere else we got a little bit off track. So it's fairly easy to excuse me, to double check where you are in the pattern because it should also make sense at the very end. Um, but sometimes it's not as easy to figure out where it went off a little bit. So we'll give that a try again, just another way to practice thinking about the, the alphabet names and, and the intervals. We'll also go on and do the next page, page 18. And this is just gonna be a little bit of a review for us with accidentals. Remember, accidental is kind of that umbrella term. I don't know why. Um, could have been called a purposeful, I don't know. But it's an umbrella term that talks about any modification that we can make um, to the original note. So that includes sharps, flats, and naturals. Later on, that'll also include things like double sharps and double flats, which are crazy fun. We won't get to that for a very long time. Um, for now, it's just those three, sharps, flats, and naturals. So they give you a nice little quick review of what all of those do when they occur on a note, how they change the note, and then you're going to get some practice with drawing them in, naming the notes, um, and at the bottom, we get a little practice with enharmonic notes. So remember, enharmonic just means we have multiple names for the same pitch. So for example, uh, D sharp is the same pitch or the same key, the same note, as E flat, right? But they can go by different names depending on how and, and where we use them in music. So they give you several notes that also have an enharmonic alternative, and they want you to fill in what that, that other enharmonic option would be. Remember when you name the notes, we do the letter first, then the sharp, flat, or natural sign. But when we do it on the staff, it is reversed. We do the sharp, flat, or natural, then we draw the note on the staff. Otherwise, we may have already played the wrong note before we see the accidental and it's too late to fix it, right? But when we write out the name, we write it like we say it. So if it was F sharp, we would write the letter F and then the sharp sign. But if we're drawing it on the staff, the sharp sign comes first and then we draw the F, okay? So we'll give that a try. Again, just getting some practice with different theory and notation things over the break. Um, we will also do our next round of interval when you come back in January. Joy to the world. Okay, so your recording you sent me, what I got looks good. It looks like we mostly are focusing on right hand. It's totally up to you if you wanna, again, keep working on that between now and Christmas. Um, we won't be working on it when we come back in January. So if you'd like to have another Christmas thing to kind of have in the mix, just to be working on for fun, go for it. The only things you wanna kind of be looking for are making sure that you're using efficient fingering for the right hand. There were a couple places where it looked like you were maybe making your life a little bit harder than it needs to be. So again, we just wanna kind of simplify that, make it as easy as possible wherever we can. So you just wanna keep that in mind if you continue working on it. Um, I think that was all that I had. Yeah, so again, what, what you sent me looks good for that. It's, it's very much up to you if you wanna keep working on that for the next few weeks. Okay, 
The next thing that we were gonna start today, or yesterday, was the Counting Stars lead sheet. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna send you a copy of the first page so that you can have that to look at as you practice the next few weeks. With this, it's kind of interesting. I wanna just break down a little bit for you so that you would have an idea of, of what to work on. So because this is <laughs> a more classic pop song than Can't Help Falling In Love, um, Can't Help Falling In Love, the melody and then the chords are actually based on a different song entirely, um, which I'm blanking now. I believe it was a folk song, but don't quote me on that. I'd have to look up the history again. Um, so we get a little bit more variety and interest in the chord progressions and in the chord options available to us with Can't Help Falling In Love. With Counting Stars, we're very much in the classic four chord pop song world. There are, let me just make sure I'm not lying. Oh, there are five chords, but one of them we use exactly one time. <laughs> and the rest of the time, we only use four. So, okay, I think that's safe to uh, assume is pretty much classic four chord pop song. So what that means is we really are not going to have the kind of challenge that we had with the last lead sheet of differentiating our, our chord progressions and remembering a lot of different chords and inversions. We'll have a different set of challenges here because we're basing this off of something that the original recording everybody's very familiar with. Um, and it's a very layered multi-instrument track. So we have a lot of movement from a lot of different instruments and sounds and your ear will automatically detect that all those things are supposed to be there, but they're missing. So when it comes to doing just a piano version of this kind of lead sheet, we wanna make sure that we're still representing a lot of the core elements of what we recognize with this particular song. For example, this has a very strong uh, kick drum, we call it four on the floor pulse. So once we get into the, the, the verse here after that opening intro, it's very much da, 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 This is just going <laughs> the whole time. If we don't have something that feels kind of like that four on the floor steady backbone, it's gonna not really seem like the song. It's gonna seem like something's missing. What that means for us is we're going to imitate that with the left hand, okay? So that left hand is going to be doing something like either bass notes like this, right? Or, oh, I invented some of those notes, it's fine. Or we'll do something that's a little bit more filled out. Right, we'll, we'll look at some options there once we've kind of gotten used to that. But then that means if, if our left hand is, is kind of just plunking away on that, that downbeat there, the right hand is gonna have the main responsibility for the chords, okay? So previously, again, very different approach, right? We started off with the triads, we had some bass notes and, and chords, and then we started experimenting more with inversions and with broken triads and with different feels and all kinds of things like that. With this, we're going to start with the basics again, but then we are going to focus on how we can imitate a lot of those core elements of the original production. From there, we can start getting more creative with what you want to include or how you wanna make changes because you will also be singing along with it as well. So for this week or the next couple weeks, what that means is we're gonna start with just getting used to the chords and root position for both hands separately. So I'm gonna demo this for you here in a second. But like I said, for the most part, we have four chords. <laughs> and so it's gonna not be anything super crazy, but we do wanna just start by adjusting to what the chords are, um, getting comfortable with the notes and the transitions, and then how that applies to the first page of the lead sheet. So what I'm gonna do is move my stuff around here. And I'm gonna switch the view over to the keys here so that that way I can show you, again, just the, the basics of what that 
that chord progression will look like. Okay, let's see. We're gonna hope my iPad doesn't decide to take a trip here. Okay, so we're starting with, and again, you'll, I'll send you the first page so you'll have this in front of you when you practice, but we're starting with a C sharp minor chord. So your notes for that are gonna be C sharp, E, and G sharp. And then we're going to an E chord, E major, so that'll be E, G sharp, and B. From there, we're going to B, so that'll be B, D sharp, and F sharp. And then we're going to an A chord, A, C sharp, and E. So for each hand, you're gonna start getting comfortable with that progression, C sharp minor, Same thing for left hand. We'll practice left hand one octave lower for right now. Again, we're just getting used to this and we'll make our, our different changes for the particular arrangement later. So we'll start with that C sharp minor, E, B to A. If you're feeling bold, you can do both together. But again, like I said, we're going to be uh, making some changes pretty quickly in there once we get comfortable with the chords when we come back we'll we'll start breaking down exactly what we want to do for each main section of the song okay let's see uh, okay so we covered that okay um, sight reading. So I did not get a sight reading example from you. Remember when we do these, I can only give you feedback or keep us moving forward on whatever I get. So don't forget, I know we haven't really had a lot of time recently for a little while with all of the other stuff we've been doing to really do that in our lessons as much, but you should still be doing a sight reading exercise every time you practice, all right? If we want to get better with the sight reading and have that feel more comfortable, that's the best way to do it. But if it's inconsistent or hardly ever happening, um, that's not gonna really feel like it's, it's progressing or serving a purpose that way. So just make sure that you're, you're remembering to do that. Always follow along on your practice notes because I'm usually pretty good <laughs> about writing down everything that I want you to be doing even if we didn't have time to get to it in the lesson. So when you send me stuff for these videos, just make sure that you're double checking your, your most recent practice notes, hitting everything on there so that way we can um, address it and keep moving forward. And then the other thing I wanted you to do is start working on some new technique over the break. So we're going to be starting um, to expand our scales to two octaves. So far we've done C, G, and F scales, but just with one octave. Now, oh, we've done D, A, and E too, I think, haven't we? Yes. No. I'm confusing myself now. No. We have not. Okay, just kidding. So we've only, <laughs> I should trust my gut. Okay, we've only done C, G, and F. So what we're gonna do next is we're going to actually work on expanding those into two octaves. The nice thing is once we've expanded a scale to two octaves, we can do it in any number of octaves because we just repeat the same adjustment. Um, we start with one octave at first just to get used to doing an eight note scale where we have to be crossing over and under and, and making some modifications there. So now what I'm going to do is again demo this for you i'll have a new technique page for you to help break it down when you come back but for now we'll just kind of go off of the video demonstration here for your practice this week well there was something else i wanted to demo i was right okay please stay all right so we're going to do two octaves for right hand which is actually and we're just starting with c major here it actually is going to just start the same way. So let me make sure. Yes, okay, I have enough room. So we're going to start with playing the first three notes, crossing under on F. And here, this is where we would normally use the pinky on C and then come back down. But since we're doing another octave, we're just going to cross under again on C. And now we can start over for the second scale. This time we will use the pinky on top. Okay, coming down, we're gonna come down again. This is how we would normally start it anyway, coming down the first five notes and crossing the third finger over. 
but that only gets us one octave. So now we're gonna cross the fourth finger over this time to B, and then three goes over on E again to get us all the way back down to that original C. So basically, when we get to that first octave C, where we would normally use the pinky, we're going to be instead replacing with the thumb. So it, it kind of takes the place of, of the pinky there. But again, from here, you can do any number of octaves. Because it's just all following the same pattern, okay? So I'm gonna play the whole thing for you again so you can see all of the, the finger changes there. I won't talk through it this time. But basically, when we go up, we're crossing under after the third finger, after the fourth finger, and after the third finger again. So you cross under on F, C, and F. And when we come down, once we get to the thumb and we've run out of fingers, we cross over with the third finger, and then with the fourth finger, and then with the third finger one more time. So here's what the whole thing looks like. reversed. So again, because we don't have fingers like this, we have to swap the order that we're doing, but we're applying the same technique and principles here. So we're going to start left hand by coming up the first five notes. And then we cross the third finger over. So far, this is exactly what we would normally do anyway. Now we're out of fingers. So in order to do the second octave, we're going to cross the fourth finger over to D. So under on G, and then on C, and then on G again. Okay, so that looks like this. So you just want to make sure that as you're practicing this, you're being careful to not mix up where you cross over and under. Again, if you want to take notes to yourself or write out all the letter names and the finger numbers that go with them, that's a, a good idea to help you make sure that you're keeping it straight when you practice. But we don't want to be kind of inventing new places to cross over or under. We want to really establish this muscle memory for these fingering patterns. They're going to apply to a lot of our scales and they're going to show up in a lot of our songs too. So that's one of the reasons that we work on it this way because... It really is very helpful when we see it in repertoire. It's easy to recognize, oh yeah, that's that's a C arpeggio or a C chord or a C scale, right? If we've already kind of committed that fingering more or less to memory, or at least we're familiar with it, it's gonna be a lot easier to put it into the context of a song whenever we have it. So that will be, I'm just double checking, the last thing, yep, that we'll do for the break. Uh, I'm gonna have a new song for us to start as well when we come back in January. But like I said, just kind of, Find that balance for you between taking some time off and getting some rest and um, continuing to work on some of this newer stuff that we have. Okay, so we'll move on to voice. Okay, so I'm going to send you a recording of a new warm up. I believe it's, I'm sure it's one that we've done before um but i'll it's the one that we were going to do yesterday in the lesson so i'll just do a new recording of that send it over to you to get something um at least different uh as far as range or frequency or from whatever the last time that we worked on this particular exercise was um so you'll have that in your mix for your warm-ups for the next few weeks uh we are also going to continue or resume our concone so the last thing we were working on was number 11, just with the melody recording. So at some point over the break, we'll just start to revisit that um, so that we can continue moving forward with that in January when we come back. And still just working on the melody recording is fine. If you get to a point where you are able to start working on it with the, the track, it's already on YouTube, ready to go, easy to find. So you're welcome to try that out if you get to that point. But if not, no worries. We'll just wanna make sure that we're at least getting 
re-familiar with the uh, melody there for January. And then I didn't get a recording for Counting Stars. So remember, we're practicing that with the karaoke in the original key, um, getting comfortable with that vocally so that by the time we have figured out what we want to do with the piano lead sheet, we can start working on that together as well. Okay, I think that's pretty much it. We've kind of gotten to a, a point where we get to have a normal amount of vocal things to work on again. So um, yeah, if you have any questions about any of that when you watch this video, let me know. Um, I just may take a little bit to get back to you if uh, I'm in break mode as well. So um, like I said, have that nice balance between rest and continuing to move forward with this stuff. But Otherwise, I will see you in January. Have a great end of the year. Merry Christmas, and I'll see you in a couple weeks.